All right. Welcome, everyone, to Beyond the Veil. Um, it's good to see you guys up here. Let me get my chat box pulled up. Um, hello, 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 hello. It's good to see 70 of you guys up here. Um, if you could, um, while you're already here, uh, go on and hit the like button and the subscribe button so we can get this thing going. I do want to say I am having a little bit of an internet issue going on today, um, so it may be a little laggy. Um, if it happens to like skip out at all in this video that I'm making, make sure you go back and start it over, uh, maybe later and it'll, it should pick up back through and I'm going to go back and edit whatever I need to. Um, but I do want to say I'm very, very excited to talk with you guys tonight. Um, I do want to say though, it's not going to be our usual kind of deep dive into banana sandwich bill. Um, to be honest with you, um, I don't. I don't really know much of what's going to be said right now other than what needs to be said. Uh, there's 78 of you here right now. I truly hope you guys understand the meaning of repentance. Um, I want to talk to you guys specifically Bible tonight. Um, we're not going to go diving down Wikipedia rabbit holes. <laughs> we're not going to go diving down Google rabbit holes. What we're going to do is I'm going to share my screen real quick and I'm going to show you what we're going to do. Um, I do want to say, if you're not following along on my Facebook page, I do encourage you guys to go check that out. Um, if you've been there for the last, I don't know, six months, eight months, maybe a year, um, you know that I used to go live all the time, and it was not these YouTube type videos. It'd be more along the lines of, I was back... <laughs> standing up behind a pulpit of a church building. And um, I want to share that side of me that a lot of people haven't really seen here on YouTube so far. And there's a lot of people coming over here from my Facebook page that don't really know that side of me either uh, very well. So I'm going to deep dive into what it was like pastoring in a church and um, what I had to go through as far as where I am now. And this isn't going to be my normal testimony. This is going to be something we need to hear. Okay. Um, you know, I grew up in a church, a wonderful church. It's still right now to this day, only about three and a half minutes up the road. Um, when I grew up in my mom's house, it was actually more like 30 seconds up the road. Uh, I could see it from my mom's house. And uh, that place, you know, was a wonderful place. Um, you know, growing up, I remember so many times sitting there in the pew and, you know, I'd hear bits and pieces of the sermon. I think one of the most th the most wonderful things about the church service, the church building service was. I guess I guess it brought a sense of peace, you know, knowing that other people believe in what you believe in. It's a good feeling. Uh you know, to be sitting and surrounded by people that have kind of the like mind as you, in a sense. It's a good feeling. However, um, I don't want you guys staring down this screen. It's probably bad for you. I'm going to pull this up here. However, here's this, okay? Do you know what I remember more of in the church growing up than anything? Growing up? Because I'm sure a lot of you guys have this same exact story. You know, I, I remember sitting in the pew with my legs propped up there. And I would have, you know, that little paper, the Jehovah's Witness type papers they have by the same people <laughs> sitting there in the pews and you turn it over and there's a blank side to it and you're coloring and drawing. And I remember I would draw some of the best pictures. And, you know, I'd be at peace doing it. I'd hear, I'd be like, man, he's up there talking about God. You know, he's got to be real. I got my mom sitting here beside me. So, you know, I know she ain't led me astray whatsoever. So I'm just sitting there doodling, doodling, sometimes tic-tac-toeing. Sometimes I do the little dot thing where you put little dots all over the place and then you do the little lines to connect them. I got a twin brother. His name's Justin. And my name's Dustin. Um, we would sit there and kind of do that whole thing. And, you know, we get really excited when it was youth group time because we'd go in the back and there'd always be something fun. We could color. We could go outside and play basketball. We could go and do kind of fun things. And that went on until I was like 18 years old. You know, I went to church camp every summer. Matter of fact, my junior year of high school, I got camper of the week. So they actually paid for me to come back the next year. 
Uh, you know, I loved the Bible back then, all that stuff. Because I was just going with the motions. You know, you'd be handed John 3.16. Memorize this. You'd be handed, you know, your basics. And that was it. You know, but as most of you, we got caught up in the school systems and everything else. So by the time we hit 18, we're ready to get out of high school. We're ready to get out of our mom's house. We're ready to get out of the church. We're ready to get out of all kinds of things. Because we're apparently adults at 18 and we had nothing to do earlier in our life, right? So, you know, when we turn 18, we just kind of do whatever we want. And a lot of us turn from the church building assembly and being by around like-minded people because you're like, man, I can't, I can't go back in there. You know, I got to party hardy on Saturday night and make sure I get in there on Sunday morning. I can't. I can't do it. My mom would be so disappointed in me. And then they'd be disappointed in me. They'd be very ju judgmental and I can't do that. So then you go on about your life. And if you're anything like me, you end up making a lot of bad mistakes. You know, I've shared so many stories on my Facebook page with you guys. I think one of my hardest ones I ever had to do is when I started this mobile baptistry ministry, I took off to Pennsylvania um, to baptize some people online that wanted to get baptized up there. And one of them happened to be a guy that I lived with while I was in Pennsylvania. And um, this was back in 2012. I remember being there and, whoo. It was tough. My ex-wife. Yes, I got an ex-wife. I got a daughter by her too. You know, Abraham also had a, a Hagar and a, and other children as well. You know, I had an unequally yoked marriage and we're going to leave it as that. I'm not going to sit here and bash and slander and this and that, but it is what it is. Um, but she put me through some mess and I uh, stayed in Pennsylvania only for the reason of wanting to see my daughter. And, uh, Man, I got involved in everything you can think of. To the point I was living on the street with garbage bags. And I'm not kidding when I say that. I had three big black garbage bags. I was carrying things around with me, everything, everywhere. I mean, it had my clothes in there. It had whatever I had left from North Carolina when I ran away from home to rebel with this girl and everything else. I had all that in there and I lost it all, man. But I was living out in, in garbage bags. Until Chris, that guy was going to baptize a couple of well, last year, but it'd been years since I seen him. Me and him would party hard because, man, I, I he'd let me sneak into his dorm room and I'd crash in his dorm every night on campus. So it was illegal, <laughs> but I'd sleep on his couch and I'd be out of there in the mornings before all the students would come up. Um, and I lived there for a while until, you know, my my ex wasn't letting me see my daughter. That's getting rough. It was it was tough. To the point where, you know, I didn't have anybody left my family all in North Carolina. I went up there and I wanted to freaking kill myself. Literally. I went on the middle of the Wilkes-Barre and uh, Kingston Bridge. And I stood on that thing right in the middle of the night just waiting to jump. <laughs> Put it all on a phone call to my mom. In the middle of the night, who hadn't talked to me in so long. I was like, look, if she answers this phone right now, I won't do it. Second ring, she answers the phone and buys me a bus to get home. You guys ever taken a Greyhound bus? I had never taken a Greyhound bus. So I threw my three garbage bags underneath the Greyhound bus in Pennsylvania, ready to go home and see my family that I hadn't seen in years. And uh, when you're going state to state, you got to transfer Greyhound buses. I didn't know they didn't transfer your stuff for you. I thought it was like a, I thought it was like a train thing. Dude, I lost everything. Everything I own. Which don't sound like much to you guys because it was three garbage bags full of clothes and pictures and things that meant everything to me. It was my house. But I got back home and I started over my life and joined the military. Boy, that was amazing. Let me tell you. Hmm. Uh. Um, I, I don't want to get into that whole can of worms. <laughs> but I got out of the military. It was in three and a half years. And, um, man, when I got out, it was crazy. I mean, I was having two to three seizures a day for a little bit. My wife would tell you straight up, man, I would forget I had to go to the bathroom on the way to the bathroom and forget where I was halfway to the bathroom. 
my psychiatrist had me taking a stupid brown paper bag around with me in my ACU pants pocket so I could breathe in it just right and I get worked up. I mean, on 16 pills a day at one point. Because, who they get them paychecks, huh? Man. And, you know, throughout all that whole mess, I had so many just signs right in front of my face. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> one of those signs was at night, man. I wanted to die. You know, I was like, my mom ain't going to want to talk to me. I just straight up blew her off for years. And I'm calling at 3 o'clock in the morning. Ain't no way. I should have been like, man, that's a sign. Here's a fun story of why I joined the military. I was up one night, and you can look this up yourself. Matter of fact, we'll look it up together. Man rescues crash victim moments. Ooh, my typing. Before car explodes hey so if i hit enter here you guys are going to be like this is probably going to take you to some chuck norris video no i'm just going to take you here watch this my name is so look man rescues crash victim moments before a car explodes out of 27 million results here's my name <laughs> number one let's read what it says here martin county that's me hey that's me This was, like I was saying, 2011. This is when the report came out. Check this out. A car crash in the late hours of the night sounded like a slam of a screen door to Dustin Barr and his roommates inside his Martin County home. When they walked outside, they saw flames higher than the power lines. You could hear the car sizzling, Dustin Barr said. I could feel the heat 20 to 30 yards away from the car. The driver, 21-year-old, Asher Turner, managed to crawl out of his wrecked car into a nearby ditch. And that's where they got that story all wrong. Let me tell you what happened. This was crazy. Oh, I didn't share the screen with you guys. Here, let me, let me show you. So here's what I did. All I did was I typed in man rescues crash victim moments before car explodes. And then I popped up here, first one. So I wanted to tell you guys this story real, real quick about this, this whole thing. That I should have took as another sign in my life. Like, what are you doing? So I'm going to tell you guys this story real quick. <laughs> um, so that night was nuts. I mean, I was like drugged out. Everything was bad. Making horrible, horrible decisions in my life. <laughs> this was in between the military phase and moved back home and got around my whole old crowd again. Middle of the night, we were torn up. And all of a sudden, about one o'clock in the morning, no joke, I heard this crunch. It was like, crunch. and um, anyway, I, I tried to share my screen. I don't know why I didn't share. But anyway, here goes. I'm going to tell you guys a story. Um, woke up in the middle of the night, heard this crunch. Um, the sound literally like, you know, those aluminum um, screen doors that you get on the back of like a trailer home, and, you know, you slam it. Well, uh, I'm telling you, it sounded exactly like it. Matter of fact, it scared the daylights out of me. I thought it was somebody slamming our door, you know. I was in the living room with my friends, and wham! But I go to the kitchen, and I look out there, and all of a sudden, no joke, I see this minivan sitting up there, and I lived at the bottom of this, like, Colbert, and um, it was this guardrail, this metal guardrail going down, and this van had ran into it, I mean, head on, where it just split right down the center of the car. And pushed the engine right back in Asher Turner's lap. That's what had happened. And um, when I looked out the window, you could just see little sparks popping out of his hood and a little itty bitty flame. And all I thought, you know, beating me in the middle of the night, I was like, man, this is going to be a whole family out here. This is going to be what is happening right now. But no joke, something in me was like, go. And I took off running across my yard and I took off running to that van. And like, I remember walking around the corner and I saw that poor guy, Asher. Half his body was hanging out of, his car, out of the car. The other half was just trapped in the stupid engine. And I was like, man, what am I going to do? I remember I ran up to him and 
I was like, it's going to be okay. You know, I got anxiety disorder, all that mess is crazy. I was like, I was like, man, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I grabbed him. And when I grabbed him, you know, that little spark started getting bigger and bigger. I was like, oh, oh my goodness. I grabbed him. And I mean, I turned. I, I, I think it was probably five steps. I grabbed dragging him five steps away from that car. And I mean, you hear like it's whistling and then and I fall on top of him. And he's underneath me and it's just, I could feel it just right on my back. Three seconds later, that dude was blown up. And um, man, I hollered to my friends. They were standing in the yard. And I was like, go get a blanket. Go get a blanket. Let's wrap him up. Let's, you know, he's freezing. It was so cold. I remember it was so cold, but I was so wound up. I felt like Chuck Norris. <laughs> I remember laying, laying there on the ground right there beside him. And I was like, dude, it's going to be all right, man. It's going to be all right, buddy. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if it was going to be all right. I was like, it's going to be all right, man. And all he wanted to do is call his mom. And so I grabbed him his phone and now I looked for his mom and called his mom and they ended up taking to the doctor, broke both his legs. Poor guy, man. His mom died six months later. You know, I go from seeing this, this this man making a mistake in the middle of the night coming home from a club to turning his life around like wanting to do better i mean i'm telling you like when he went to the hospital i was i remember he came over to my house in a wheelchair i'd never met the dude before my life but he came to my house in a wheelchair and gave me a check for 500 bucks from his mom and i just saw this change and uh, poor thing, man. I mean, six months later, just both. And I'm like, man, what in the world? You know, why? It's so easy to get mad at God. I'm telling you, like, that's not nothing this, that nobody said throughout history. You got to understand Moses was like, hey, man, look, don't kill these people. It is what it is. He gives and he takes away, but you got to see the bigger picture. You know, you got to see the sign in front of you. My sign then was like, you got to change. You got to do better. I took it as a sign. Of, oh, man, I, I'm a superhero. I'm going to jo join the military. Hoo -hoo. Literally, like that next day, <laughs> I was ready to sign up for the army. The news people came and interviewed me, all that mess. It was crazy. And then, you know, I joined the military and I'm telling you what. People don't understand what people go through in the military. You know, you don't even have to go overseas to go through things in the military. As far as when I say overseas, I'm saying like you don't have to go in straight up war zone combat. Matter of fact, war zone combat isn't even what kills a majority of the military. Do you know what the number one killer in the military is right now? Suicide and drinking and driving. Far more than soldiers getting killed. I wonder how many people know that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people are like, oh, if you join the military, you're going to get killed in combat, this and that. No, we are. We are America's military. <laughs> we are the the arms of the serpent over here. But, you know, it's crazy. You know, in our life, we see a lot of times where things just like pop up right there and we just ignore it. We're like, it can't be. It's not time yet. You know, I remember... I remember when I got back from Pennsylvania, I was like, I still got plenty of time to turn my life around. I was like, God pulled me out of that. I was like, it's all good. Got back from the military. You literally, I don't even remember coming home from Germany. It was crazy. I'm telling you, a month of my month and month and a half of my life is like gone. I had people come up and meet me at Fort Bragg that I was like, who the who in the world are you? Like, what in the world? What's going on? What's going on? And then my wife's right there loving me the whole time. But anyway, here's this, okay? I go through all that. And, you know, I wonder every day, I'm like, man, you know, I wonder if I would have changed back then, if I would have, like, not lost my son right here. I was like, man, maybe if, 
Maybe if that right there would have been different, maybe this would have been different. If I would have listened just a little bit more, it would have been so different. You ever said that? You were like, man, just one more time. Just give me one more sign, please. I don't, I don't, I don't think people get it. That's why I'm at the point now. I'm like, I don't care to see a sign. I don't want to see a sign. And he's like, look, son, look, look. And I'm like, I know. I'm sorry I ignored it for so long. I know I get it now. That's why I get like I get on Facebook and YouTube. Like, if you can't see what in the world's happening, then maybe you've ignored too many signs in your life and you're continuing to ignore signs in your life. You know, my Facebook page has gone absolutely eight bananas. And I'm telling you, I thought it was hard keeping up with the little bit of people that were following along and six million people interacting with my page in two days. And yet I feel like every single one of them, every single one of them are just refusing. Ooh. So many are just refusing to see things that are right in front of their face. And I'm like, look, I was right there. Don't do it. Please don't do it. You know, I praise God so much for for so much that I, he put me through now is so different. It's different. You know, like I said, it was easy to hate and be mad at God in this world because it's broken and we're quick to blame the creator. But we forget that we're. Anyway, here's here's where, here's where I want to get at, okay? I want to make sure my screen share is working. It should be. It's working on my end. And we're going to dive into the Word of God real quick. Because this is something that you guys need to be paying attention to. Something that I need to be paying attention to. And, um, you know, I've seen it brought up a lot. Everybody's quick to bring up the map. Matter of fact, I could probably pull it up here. You know, the map of... The eclipse passing over the United States. Everybody's like, oh, wow, look, it's got Jonah at the entrance of this whole eclipse. It's got the, the town of Jonah it's entering into. And then it goes Nineveh, 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 Nineveh. And look, it passes right over the Ark encounter in Kentucky. What do you know? And then it passes right over the Athena statue and temple right there. What do you know? And before that, it was crossing the other way, going Salem, 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 Salem. Everybody's like, oh, that's incredible. That's so cool. Man, I got to make sure I go see this eclipse. I got to make sure I'm standing right in the path of this thing. Please give me a front row seat. Whew. You know, I hear something that a lot of people forget, and it's the whole point of me preaching hard lately on this thousand year rain thing. Do you know why they hide the thousand year rain? Because they don't want you to think that it's the very end yet. <laughs> they want you to think that it's just him going to come and make it peaceful and then Satan will be released again at a later time and there'll be more wars of Gog and Magog at a later time. That'll be thousands of years away now. We've been in the World War One, twos, and soon to be the final World War Three in history. Now, you know, they hide all of Tartaria and all the other evidence we've covered in this past couple of weeks. They've covered it up because they don't want you to see that this is this is the other part of the conversation that the church don't want to talk about. You know, I, I want to make this clear, okay? It's important you don't get the great white throne of judgment and the eternal reign when things are thrown into the lake of fire like death and hades and satan that's the very end and that's the eternal reign forever it's important you don't get that confused you know when everything rolls back and new jerusalem comes down at the very very end to do away with satan it's important not to get that confused with a thousand year reign because there's a different situation going on right now see people want to want to do this okay they want to combine things when Christ said this word for word. They approached him. 
they say, hey, what will be your sign? But they also he also said this. <clears throat> they wanted to know two things. They said, when are you coming back? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? That's two different things. When will we be coming back? And what will be the sign of the very end? The very end. That's two different things. And he pointed out two different directions multiple times, but people want to sit there and combine them. So um, here's something I want you to pay attention to. There's the end of everything. Because, you know, he said, Lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That's when everything rolls up like a scroll and is done. Okay. Now I want to point out a scripture to you. Okay. Let's go here. Let me make sure I'm still screen sharing. Yes, absolutely. Okay. This is important because we're going to do two different readings tonight. And we may read more Bible than a lot of you guys have read in a long time. But this is us right here. You know what generation we are? We... We are an evil, evil Satan set loose again, causing roars and rumors of wars and stirring up the people around the camp of the saints. And he says, even the elect in those days will be deceived. We're an evil, evil generation. And you remember he said word for word to them. He said, this generation shall not pass away until these things happen. Well, that, what was that? Well, that was when he was referring to him coming on the clouds. And we talked about it in depth. But here's this. Let's read this together and see what this sounds like to you and me. Okay. Whew. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Meaning this. Master, we would like to see a sign. Can you show us a sign? Like a lot of people are doing right now. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with, with this generation and shall condemn it. But they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with, its genera with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. I want you guys to do a little math with me right now. Okay, and think hard about this, okay? Let's think about what we've talked about with Jerusalem's fall in 66 AD to 73 AD, AD meaning year of the Lord. Um, it's important to understand what took place there, okay? But it's also important to go back and realize what happened to, at the time of Christ. So you got to remember, Christ was hanging there on that cross, and he looked up at his Father in heaven, and he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? And he gave up the ghost. And there was thunderings, there was lightnings, there was earthquakes, there was tombs that were opened. And many saints exited out of their tombs and entered into that great holy city. And many saw it, meaning appearing unto many. It's important to understand that that happened. Okay. And with that said, there's this. Don't you remember he talked about the darkness? And I also want to point this out that it's actually documented during that time, okay, of the darkness that was going over in general in the land, not just from Pompeii up the road, but but you got to realize the fire of Rome had just taken place also where 70% of Rome was burned up. But there's also this. See, when Christ died, it talked about the darkness as well. See, what's the chances of now? There's an eclipse passing right around the same time as Easter. Well, the date of Easter. By Easter, I mean the crucifixion. I want to say that again. So it's just I want to talk as slow as I can. Like, so everybody just stays on the track with this. OK, what's the chances? OK, of right now, 200 years later. OK, I mean, 2000 years later. OK, 
on the around the same time we celebrate literal east i don't like saying easter the crucifixion of christ okay the the, the true passover is what i want to say that's what it should be what is the chances of us having a blackout eclipse taking place in the middle of the day just like when christ died see what i believe is this see and, and it wasn't just the darkness that passed over but when the darkness passed over there was thunderings there was lightnings and there was earthquakes and the ground split open and the veil ripped in two so what i want to say is this there's only two things that can cause a blacked out sky and earthquakes and volcanoes and all other kinds of things okay and um i see rock down there talking about passovers two weeks after april absolutely right but you know what else is off the calendars Matter of fact, every single year puts us off and behind just a little bit and a little bit more. That's what I've been trying to get at. That's what makes this eclipse something special. Everybody's like, oh, we had an eclipse last year. Nah, this eclipse is different. Matter of fact, this is the first one of this specific eclipse that's been documented since 200 years. I'm talking about this, this one that's crossed and crossed, okay? Now, I need you to also understand that what I've been telling you guys about being this is the biblical place from the Bible. <laughs> What would happen if something like that happened? Okay. Now, here's this, okay? I truly believe that we are in the, the same, I mean, same place, same time, same everything as back then. Because here's this also. See, if you know about the story of Jonah, which we're going to read here in just a sec. If you know about the story of Jonah very in depth, you understand that Jonah and Nineveh is also taking place after the Tower of Babel. See, I've been doing research on other things. Like, people don't understand that they're limited now to 66 books after they apocrypha, which means hidden, taken out, removed, by the way. Removed certain books. It's important to understand the, cate the category of things and also, like, where places, where things fall at in timelines. See, you got to understand Nineveh. And I talked to my buddy George about this yesterday. Nineveh itself was where nimrod went by nimrod i mean the mighty man okay after the tower of babel spell okay and he split the people up literally he sent a third of the people off that were turned into ape-like people and then a third of them he sent off that were turned into elephant-like people and this is why in india they worship the half elephant half half elephant half human person and also they worship the ape the half ape half person and this is why they got the planet of the apes right there in plain sight too that started from nineveh not, I mean, they're not Nineveh, Babylon. See, when Babylon fell, it said the earth swallowed up a chunk of it, and then he tore down and destroyed the rest of it. Okay, and then the workers, he turned half into ape-like people and half into elephant-like people. And like I say, they had to migrate, and that's where they come over to India and that part of the world, that same thing going on. But here's my thing. After that happened, you got to understand, Nimrod did not get destroyed in the Tower of Babel. Okay, and there's also this. People don't know, people are forgetting also there was also the Babylon of the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar who became a beast and went out in the wilderness for a bit too and came back. See, that Nebuchadnezzar kingdom, that was another Babylon right there. And you got to understand where Nimrod went after the Babylon fell was to Nineveh. He was the reason why there were literal, not just Nephilim, but Raphaim giants, big giants, huge giants in that land. Okay. By that, what I'm trying to get at is that was that great king that was even there. I don't mention his name, just like it don't mention his name as Nimrod. Nimrod means mighty man. There's a reason why his name has been taken out of the Lamb's Book of Life. That's why it's also named, his name also was Pharaoh. <laughs> okay, you got to understand that these things are like that for a reason. Just like Eve's name is in the Bible up until after the fall as well. Then you don't hear about her anymore either. Now, here's my thing. Okay, Nineveh, when this happened, a lot of the same type stuff happened. Okay, there was a sign given, according to Christ. There was nothing given other than the sign that jo that was given in the days of, of Jonah. Okay, and Jonah, the only thing he had to say was repent, repent, the end is here. Okay, now what I, what I believe also was taking place was another exact what we're seeing in this moment as well okay a wrath being passed over and they can absorb the sign or ignore the sign we're obviously going to ignore the sign i just want you to know that most of the world is ignoring this sign right now and this is going to bring us into world war three it just is what it is 
And it's no coincidence that the 200 year cicadas locusts follow this eclipse, literally. And if you look at the dates for the cicada releasing, guess where it goes from? It goes from literal beginning of April to April 20th, which is like covering the whole month is when that whole thing is going to be taking place. You need to understand that. Okay. So here's my thing. If you compare that also to the Egyptian plagues, do you know what else came with the three days of darkness that took place in the land during that time? Well, the locust as well, right there, the same, that those same moments were locusts involved. It's always the same type stuff going on. Okay. Now everybody's like talking about this sign of Jonah as far as like they're seeing Jonah and Nineveh all across the thing. But I'm saying this. We're getting X'd out now. Okay. It's no like repent and we're going to be better. Okay. Like the whole nation is going to stand. I'm telling you guys. I want you guys to understand that he has given this nation more than any nation. More than any nation. I'm talking about like any of them out there is given this nation right here more opportunities, more chances than anyone else. Need you to understand that. I want to repeat that again. He's given this nation here that we're in, America. He's given us more chances and opportunities than anyone else in the world. I don't care if you're broke or rich living here in America. Your brokenness here is still nothing compared to what's going on in the rest of the world. And let me tell you this, you can be broke and run your mouth to the government all you want to and say things, this and that. You do that overseas, you get in trouble. You keep your mouth closed over stuff like that. Okay. Um, I see Trailblazer up here. I want to I want to talk about this too at some point, um, which I have on the Godzilla page. I just want to talk about this isn't just the, the year of the dragon. This is the year of the blue dragon by blue dragon i'm referring to god the whole thing about godzilla i encourage you guys to go watch that see if this is the final battle of gog and magog and this is the final battle of literally satan's army against this camp of the saints well this is also the final battle that's coming up between literal god his sword which is his son and leviathan okay and i want to say this too if this locust thing is true, I'm, I'm telling you, we've got a rough, we've got a rough coming happening. And I want you guys, 140 of you at least that are watching right now, to really, really focus hard on repentance. Like right now. That's the whole reason I wanted to go live is just to, to tell you guys, seriously, more than ever in your life, repent. Because you got to understand. My whole point of telling you guys about the church at the beginning of the video and my history there and how much I loved being in the church and also loved pastoring the church. I loved hugging every single sweet old lady that would come and hug my neck on the way out of church and hand me some baked good that she spent all week making too. I missed those. It was sweet. It was wonderful. I missed shaking every single man's hand that would sit there and probably talk junk about me to their wife right after the service. I miss. I miss standing there at an elder and deacon's meeting and sitting there listening to the man bickering about where they're going to send a hundred to two hundred dollars after they just pocket 20 grand all for tax exemption purposes stand why i'm bringing up this whole sunday worship mark of the beast here lately everybody's like oh it's going to be a physical sign no it's not i want you to remember if if, if that's true then why does he say this Remember when Abaddon is ruling in those days and his locust army comes up, he sends his locust army to go after the ones that does not have the mark of God on their forehead. I need to ask you guys, do y'all see a. Do you see a mark? Do you see a mark on my forehead? I need you guys to actually get up and go look in a mirror and see if you're claiming to be God's people. And I'm claiming to be God's child. OK, we're, we're all children of God. If we're born again in Christ, if we're claiming that then we're. Do we see a physical mark on our forehead? Yeah, but you're you're having faith, right? That those locusts, they're going to overpass you when Abaddon comes in his darkness and all this stuff that's supposed to happen with Abaddon and the locust army and all this mess for five months. You're praying and hoping that you've got his mark on your forehead, but you're looking for a physical mark on the enemy's forehead. You got to understand, you cannot be hypocritical. Let me say this again, okay? 
if God gave his mark, and the only time in the Bible where he literally says this is an eternal mark, a permanent sign, a permanent covenant that shall be kept in all generations over and over again, all throughout the Old Testament. If he gives that the seventh day as his mark, his sign for all generations, and then lo and behold, you've got the Pope and all of Rome pushing a mandatory Sabbath on a Sunday just like they did on the 66th day of the year in 321, which is also a 6 AD year of the Lord, third month, seventh day, March 7th, both numbers of completion. See, like I said, church is, it feels wonderful. You're surrounded by people that love, that love to have the same like-mindedness and all this and that. But let me tell you about the same like-mindedness. It's not going to grow. When you got a pastor standing up there preaching what their government has given them in a Bible college. I'm telling you this from example. I was a Dean's List student at Roanoke Bible College that became Mid-Atlantic Christian University. Dean's List student. I loved it. But the whole time I was there, it was was crazy, the mess that they were trying to teach people. Okay? So you have pastors teaching things they've been handed just like you've been handed in school. So that's where the blind, leading the blind, the, the pastor's like, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm doing what I'm told. I'm up here. I'm preaching. I'm, I'm doing my best with the Bible. This is what they taught me. And then you got the congregation. They're like, oh, my preacher's amazing because he can preach the mess out of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But this one, he can't talk about that because it don't make no sense. You know how many times I heard people standing there like, hey, please explain the Trinity to me or explain this to me, talking about two other lead pastors and stuff like this. They couldn't give him a single answer to nothing. But they can tell you quick about grace and love and not about producing fruit. He who's not producing fruit will be cut off and tossed into the fire. So. Say that with this all in mind, look, please do not spend one day a week. Other than the Sabbath, the seventh day. Truly setting it apart different for for your father. Okay, set it apart different than any other day. See, you know how you're taking Sunday and setting it apart as a day where you go and pretend to be this and this in a in a place, and you go and eat at all this food at your family's after you're trying to do something different that week. Well, how about refocus it on Saturday instead of focusing on a building or anything like that? Focus that day on on your father and his completed work in your life. How about do that? Just see what it does. Be like, I'm not going to do what the world's doing on Sunday. The first day, I'm going to go to the seventh day, the Sabbath day, as Sabado and the rest of the world, except for the English language, makes it Saturday and Sunday. I want you to understand. I want you to go and set that seventh day apart. And I want you to sit there in your home, okay, with your family who loves you and do something you haven't done before. Pick up the Bible, read it with them, or sit there and be like, hey, let's figure out how to pray together. It's going to feel really weird, but it's going to be different. And while you're sitting there resting in him, knowing whatever he's done in my life is enough, whatever he's going to do right now is enough. Sit there in your home. Don't go out and make somebody else make a sandwich for you. Don't go out and make somebody else cook for you. Don't go out and make somebody else pump gas for you. Sit in your home. One of my favorite things to think about with the Bible is think about how he's talking about them birds flying around and they ain't worrying about doing things like we are and this and that. And he's talking about the flowers, how they just got to literally just soak up the sun and go with the breeze. And then we're here panicking. Saturday comes, you're like, I got to. I got to get out and do something. And you're like, I got to do something different. I'm going to go to the beach. And then while you're enjoying your Sabbath at the beach, you're like, hey, go get my towel and make sure that you go to the gas station. And that person who is there working behind the register, make sure he works and make sure he does something for me. And I'm going to go to Walmart and I'm going to make sure I do something different and take my children shopping so that the lady at the register who should be also enjoying her day of rest in the Lord is sitting there also. You know, one of my favorite passages as far as about the Sabbath is right there in Isaiah. He teaches you how to fast and he teaches you how to enjoy the Sabbath all in one motion. I encourage you to read not just a chapter or a verse. Read Isaiah 54 all the way to Isaiah 66 tonight. So here, here we go, okay? 
the Sabbath, here's what he, here's what he says in, in the fasting thing. I want you to understand this, okay? When you fast, when you're fasting, you aren't doing it to lose weight. When you're fasting, you aren't doing it because you're so feeling, you're, you're, you're feeling like, I'm just, I have to, I have to do it. When I fast, I'm like, man, I'm not worthy to even eat. And you know what I do? This is what Isaiah says. I look for a way that when it's time for me to eat that day, whatever I was going to eat, I'm going to just try my best to give it to someone else. I've got my wife following along with that at times. I've got my, even my little son, man, he'll have days where he just wants to fast because he wants something different. But see, here's me where when I get like that, I'm like, I know what comes after the fast. Isaiah says this, if you're not fasting to get something in return as far as knowing that your father's going to do his part as well through this fast, you're not doing it because you want to lose weight. You're not doing it because of anything other than yourself. You're doing it because you want to separate yourself from the world. You want to separate yourself from the earthly food. You want to separate yourself from the earthly voices. And you're going to listen to what he says in your life. And you're going to feed on his food. And when you want to, when you have earthly food in front of you, you're going to give it to somebody else because you're going to feel full on his word. And you know what happens after? You've witnessed it tonight. You get full. Your heart burns. You want to just serve him. You want to just love him. You know, I, I don't understand how in the world people are even looking at this eclipse and everything that's going on about it and saying this is a coincidence. Do I think the world's going to come to an end on April 8th? No. Do I think that this year is going to be horrible? Absolutely. I'm just hoping a lot of people wake up and repent first. Because when this hits the fan, there's going to be a lot of people asking questions. When things hit the fan, there's going to be a lot of people saying, hey, don't you remember there was that group of people that were trying their best to tell me something about this? Nobody knows it all. Nobody. But you know what we do know? His word says that it gives us the luminaries and gives us the sun and the moon. And the stars for signs and for seasons to know when things are coming and going. You know, <laughs> how are you interpreting this sign? Are you seeing it as all oh, the world needs to change? Me, I feel more and more naked as it comes. I'm like, he sees everything. <laughs> As it gets closer, I'm like, man, the light is just shining down on us. He's looking at what's going on right now. It's like, man. I'm just going to tell you this, okay? Let me tell you. When I, um... I remember when I lost when I lost my boy. Okay, I, I I left that day from my house that I was staying in and went back to my mom's house with my wife and my my kids. And uh, I have never, and I'm going to be honest with you, <laughs> prayed before those points, other than breakfast, lunch, or dinner for a meal, like I've been told to, or before bed. I never prayed in the middle of the day before the day that I lost my son when I was pushing on his chest and blowing in his lungs after pulling him out of that pool. That was the first time I prayed because I wanted to so bad. And the first time I really wanted to pray so bad and I wanted him to hear me so bad, he's like, no. You know, I, 
what did I do to why why would I deserve him to say yes? What why would I expect him to say yes? Ignored all the other signs in my life. But here's this, okay. That was the first time I really prayed to him. I was like, please, just give him back, please. Nothing. So I got pissed off at God. And I'm telling you, I went to my mom's house. That day, the next day, all I wanted to do was die. I was like, just please kill me. Please kill me. Kill me. Yeah, I remember I, yeah, I went into my room. And I went in the shower. And you know, I, you know, growing up in mom's house, I was kind of like what I did when I was a kid to kind of cool off. Like as far as like I'd get school would be a mess and this and my bathroom upstairs where my big room was, was I'd go up there and I had my own shower, bathroom, everything right there in the room. It was cool. But I'd go up there and it's kind of like my space. I'd shut the door and I'd be pissed off on the toilet or somewhere and just mad as fire just with the door closed. And this was the first time I'd been back in that bathroom since I was a little kid in high school. And I went in there, man, and I cut on that shower, and I got... I remember propping up against that wall, and I was like, oh, I hate it here. And I was like, why are you not listening to me? I was like, I need you to talk to me right now. I need to hear you right now. And he went saying nothing, and I was screaming. So mad and standing in that shower, I'm telling you. I was so mad. I was like, dang it, what else are you gonna take? What are you gonna do? I know you're here, I know you're listening. You know, I was you know, talk about faith. I'm telling you, I had so much faith that day. I was like, you better talk to me because I know you hear me. And I was like, you better talk to me because I know you're listening to me. You ever done that? You ever known he was listening to you and just being like, why are you not saying nothing? I have. I have. So I knew he was listening. I know he's hearing me right now. And he's like, just calm down. I know. But I can't, it, I can't help it. Please don't let no sign of Jonah pop up in front of your face and it be too late. Do stuff before eclipses. Do stuff before all this mess gets like this. Repent now. Don't wait till tomorrow. And by repent, I mean this. Like if you're around your wife and my mom, I mean, not my wife. My wife will tell you it probably drives her crazy. I'll tell her things that I've done in my head. I'm like, babe, I did this today and I had this bad thought or I did this and I just every day. I'm like, and me, we still come out here and sleep in the camper that we were on the road trip on because our house got all kinds of, this is a big story, but I will lay here and at the end of every night still, I'm like, look, I forgive you and I forgive you. I talked to my wife and I talked to Brayden. I'm like, you better forgive me too, because you better not wake up and my son will be mad because I'll tell him it's bedtime or I'll tell him to turn off his phone or tell him to turn off his game. He'll be mad as fire. I'm like, look, you better not go to bed mad at me tonight. You'll drag it in tomorrow. Don't you do it. My wife too, boy. She hates that line. She'll get mad as fire at me sometimes because I'll be out here at 9.15 at night talking to you guys when I should be in there with my family. tough you got to decide to repent don't wait and i'm talking to myself too i mess up a lot still there's been so many times i've said hateful things to people on facebook that just get on my nerves and i'm like oh crap why did i do why did i say that Or, I mean, me and my wife, I can't even tell you. If you guys don't understand that marriage is not some little happy love feeling that you feel the whole time, that love is actually a, a commitment. Love is a, a job. Love is tough and hard. We're going to fight and argue sometimes. 
Your wife is going to tell you that you get on her nerves. She tells me it is what it is. And then she'll be kissing me the next day. Kids, too. My son will get mad at me sometimes. And I'm like, please, buddy, I'm so sorry, but I can't help it. I don't want you to be like everybody else. And I'll be like, I'm sorry, Dad, but I can't. And I'm like, please, just don't, don't, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Anyway. Oh. I want to leave you with this, okay? Uh, whatever you do, don't be like everybody else. Don't be scared of nothing that happens or comes or whatever. Like I say, don't sit here and be like, the end of the world is coming April 8th. No. Instead, you'd be like, hopefully I can wake up as many people between right now and April 8th as I can and tell them to repent. Maybe this is a sign of Jonah. Maybe we should repent. You should be excited. Be like, I got a mission and I've got a deadline and I've got a timeline. See, thank you so much, Chad, for that. I really appreciate it, buddy. But my thing is, is there's so many of you guys that look for something to do. Well, God's like, hey, I'm doing this thing, guys. I got this sign going on here and I'm hoping people will see it because guess what? If we repent, maybe things will change. OK, but like I said, he's like, I'm, I'm doing this thing right here and you have a job to do. The whole reason why Rome created the 501c3 modern day tax exempt bylaw church is to make lazy Christians. I'm so sorry I was part of it, but it makes you bound to one day a week. One. One day. And you can be like, no, it doesn't. It gives us no, really. I'm, I'm asking you, when is the last time you've stood up on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday and done anything near like what you did on Sunday? Yes, it feels great sitting in pews made of comfortable cushion. Yes, it's wonderful. It's got heat and AC and you can sit beside your people that live around you all the time that you don't go see and talk to and pray for during the week, really. The church building has been established so that people here have truths and they're freaking out now because people are bringing up things like flat earth, biblical cosmology, and the fact that the thousand year reign could have been a thing of the past and all this. They're like, no way that my preacher has taught me the wrong thing. It's no way the Bible is blind leading the blind is talking about the religious leaders and Pharisees of the 501c3 tax exempt Roman facility. I don't care what church you're on on Sunday. Okay. If you're in a church on Sunday morning, OK, and they're taking an offering and they're paying taxes on it. That's one thing. But you're not going to find one of those in the United States. OK, the assembly set up on Sunday. The reason why they make it a tax exempt service is so that you're also breaking Christ's command. When he says gives to Caesar unto Caesar, what is his talking about? Pay the tax of the land. First thing to do is say, hey, look, if you choose this day instead of the Sabbath, you ain't got to pay us nothing. And I'm saying that as a as a pastor of a 501c3 church. Yes, it sounds good singing songs and having music blasting in your face and lights going and then having a preacher speak a certain way with some music in the background. I did it. It was great. I could make people cry like it won't nothing up on a stage with music. But what I want you to do is get in front of somebody without all that in front of your face. Get up there without the word of God. Just have it in your heart. See what you can say. Instead, a pastor will sit there literally from Sunday to Sunday writing one sermon that'll last about 25 minutes and you give them three or four grand to talk to you and make you feel good. And the last thing I'm going to say is one of the most, th look, I'm telling you, if I was, if if I could be like, I see myself in this character here in the Bible a little bit, you know who would be? Stephen. I guarantee you I would have been the first one getting killed. First one. You know what I would have done? Right after Christ ascended, I would have went into a temple like Stephen did immediately. And I would have gone in there and been like, hey, you're doing this wrong. 
And then it'll be like, nah, you're crazy. You're this is just this crazy conspiracy theorist. So I'm like, nah, you're doing this wrong. God does not dwell in a building built by the hands of man. I would say it to their faces. Just scream at them. He left here. There is no more veil. It got ripped. He does not dwell here in this building and temple built by the hands of man. We are the church and I'm doing his work right now. I'm his hands. I'm his feet. He died for me so I can carry on his work. So I can be his, so I can just be his hands and feet. But you're like, well, wait, he, he's done enough. His, his work is completed. All we got to do is just sit and relax and wait in his grace. No, you don't. Christ spoke way more about hell and repentance than anything else in the Bible. Anything else in the Bible, it was like, hey, look, here's, here's hell, and it's hot. And here's this, and if you don't repent, I will spit you out of my mouth. If you are not hot, if you are not cold, if you're just sitting there lukewarm, I'd rather just spit you on out. You know what that is? I'm saying either you've been given a lot or you've been given a little. You're either a newborn babe that's sucking on milk and you just got baptized or you've grown up a little bit and you're carrying a cross. There's no in between. You don't sit in the water. You don't sit in the water. Matter of fact, that's like one of the main things. I'm sure Miss M, if she's up here right now, she knows that's what I told her when she was baptized. Let me see who else we got here. I know if Melissa's listening, I, I know she'll tell you. That's one of the things I said. Don't you stay in this river. When I took her to that river, I was like, don't you stay in here. You get up and you keep going. See who else we can find up here that's given their life to Christ in just the past couple of months. You don't stay there. You get up and you go. Anyway, I'm going to get off here. It's probably one of my shortest videos I've done. But I do want to say this. Okay, I want to pray with you guys. And um, I want you to focus more in your life than you ever have on repenting. It took that sinner on the cross up until that last minute of his life to finally realize I need to repent. Let's pray. Father, um, ooh, thank you so much for uh, everything. Father, I pray that so many take what they see, what they hear, what they go through, and I pray they share it forward, Father, with, with the next. Father, I pray that you, you, you teach us that everything you give us, good and bad and in between, is used for a testimony for your glory and not our own. Father, help us understand that you give us signs in our life and pull us through dark moments in our life so that we have a testimony to others about what you've done, not what we've done. Father, help us understand that you give and you take away, Father, and you can do the same with us in life. Father, we're not asked to, to do anything other than serve you. Father, we're not told that we have tomorrow. We're not even told we have until the eclipse. Father, we're not told that we have till our next birthdays or Christmases or any of those pagan things. Father, I pray that we don't look forward to anything other than what you have for us right now in these moments. And I pray that at the end of every day, we put down this day and focus on the next. Father, I know that our time is possibly running short. But I pray that if it is a short time, that you wake up as many as you can. Father, there's so many in my own family that just don't get it. There's people all over right now, Father, that just don't want to hear it. That just don't want to see it. So, Father, I pray that you please open their eyes and open their ears the way you've done so many. Father, I pray that you give us a, a voice to speak in situations that, that the enemy and all those around, Father, cannot resist, cannot stop listening to, Father. And I pray that you give us a voice, Father, that will help people turn from their sins and focus on you. And I pray that in doing so, Father, is as amazing as it is to feel and be used by you, Father, help us remain humble. 
Help us remain true and not prideful. Father, please forgive me for all the times in my life that I have. For I know I have. Man, it's so awesome to be used by you, Father. It's hard to keep anything a secret. Father, please continue to, to wake people up and draw them into your truth and let everything that's done honor and glorify you. And most importantly, Father, I want to thank you so much for your son. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice that he made on that cross for us. Father, I thank you for the life that he lived here on this earth. Father, I thank you for the, the death that, that came as well, because in death you brought him back, Father, so that we could have a relationship with you all over again. Father, And I can speak these words knowing that you can hear them in confidence because of your son. So, Father, I thank you so much for your son, Yeshua. I praise you so much for your son, Yeshua. And Father, I ask that everything that is done and, and everything brings you glory and honors you. And it's through Yeshua's name we ask all these things. Amen. All right. Um, 124 of you. Awesome. Um, if you guys could go on and hit that um, like button or whatever button down there you want to hit and the subscribe button and the share button and all those things. And um, I'll be back here in the next couple of days with some other stuff <laughs> for you guys. Um, I do want to say um, thank you so much for the guys, for the ones of you that have sat here and kind of just listened this whole time. It was a random, very random video, but I just couldn't. I had to say something tonight. <laughs> so I appreciate you guys bearing with me. Um, I hope you guys got something out of this. Um, also, I, I, I truly, truly hope that you guys take everything I said to heart. Focus on repentance. Focus on change. And focus on turning away. From the world and focusing on what God has for you in your life today. And let everything you do bring him glory. Um, so I do see a lot of you guys up here saying goodbye. I'll be back this week. Love you so much. Um, have a great night. Be sure you go check out my Facebook page. Um, if you guys are interested at all in helping out with the ministry or anything like that, I can't even remember if I typed a description on this video. I usually have my PayPal or my cash app stuff down there. If people want to give, if you want to do that, it's fine. I don't do this for money whatsoever. However, this is what I do with my life. And I want to say this, it has been very stressful <laughs> trying to keep up with hundreds of thousands of comments and messages just over the last two days. It's been amazing, but really tiresome. So if you guys can pray for my mind to settle just a little bit and for things just to calm down a little bit. It has gotten very, thank you so much. Uh, dreams happen 311. I do appreciate you guys hanging out here. I'm going to jump off here though. I'm going to spend some time with my family as you guys should as well. And I will see you on the next one. Good night from beyond the veil.